nine o'clock news from the BBC with Julia Somerville and John Humphreys. Disaster in space, the shuttle explodes. All seven on board are killed. Their families watched as it happened. President Reagan says we'll honor the dead by going ahead with the space program. Good evening. The 25th flight of the American Space Shuttle has ended in disaster. The spacecraft Challenger exploded just over a minute after takeoff from Cape Canaveral. The seven crew members, five men and two women, were all killed. They included the first ordinary citizen to go into space, a teacher called Krista McAuliffe. The disaster happened in full view of the astronauts' families who'd gathered at Cape Canaveral to watch the takeoff. It was seen by millions of other Americans watching the live broadcast on television. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. It was an apparently perfect liftoff for the shuttle, the 10th for the Challenger, till now regarded as the most reliable of the three in the shuttle fleet. The mission had been delayed two days because of the weather, another hour this morning for a minor technical fault, and it was cold down there. But the signal to launch was given, and everything was apparently on course up to a minute from liftoff when the Challenger was turning on the full power of her main engines. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. explosion appeared to come from one of the solid rocket boosters which supply most of the power for the liftoff and were then to separate. Instead, the entire space vehicle disappeared in a fireball, the Challenger disintegrated and plunged downwards in spiraling debris. The only hopeful sign was a parachute that came to Earth along with the wreckage, but there seemed no way that any of the crew of seven could have survived. And it was more than an hour before rescue ships and helicopters were even able to get to the scene because of the danger from falling debris. Among those watching at the Cape were Krista McCullough's family, her mother and father who'd come to cheer but stayed to witness the disaster. At least they were spared the close-ups and slow-motion replays that were available almost immediately to television viewers across the country. NASA aren't yet saying anything about the cause of the tragedy, but the flames that appeared just before the explosion suggested that there might have been some kind of a fuel leak that then ignited. One immediate effect of the disaster, the President postponed for a week his State of the Union speech, but insisted through his spokesman that the space program goes on. A few moments ago, the President met in the Oval Office with NASA Director Graham and instructed him to fly to the Cape with the Vice President uh, to begin an effort to find out the cause of this tragedy. And then the President said to go forward with the nation's space program. The President said, and I quote, these people were dedicated to the exploration of space we could do no more to honor them, these courageous Americans, than to go forward with the program. From the moment of the tragedy, it was assumed at the Cape that all seven were dead. Tributes to them came not only from the President, but from America's first man in space, Senator John Glenn. You know, in, in our human existence, I, let me be philosophical for a moment. I guess in our human existence, there is triumph and there is tragedy. And. Uh, man tries many things and uh, we advance as a whole human race because we because we succeed most of the time we make advances whether it's in space or engineering or health or medical things sometimes though we aren't perfect and then there's a tragedy 
that uh, brings us back to our own human frailties and our, our lack of perfection. And so that's the kind of a day we're faced with now. It's been an amazingly succe successful series of triumphs through the years. But it also is fraught with the possibility of tragedy, and that's what we came up against today. These are the first in-flight deaths and the most serious reverses ever suffered by the space agency. The more serious because the agency had put all its eggs into this particular basket of the space shuttle. And now both civilian and military programs could be set back by years. This is Martin Bell for the 9 o'clock news in Washington. Despite some setbacks over the last years, the launch of a space shuttle had become something of a routine event. But today's, the 25th, captured the imagination of the American public because an ordinary American civilian, not a serviceman or a politician, was on board. Mrs. Krista McAuliffe was married and had two children, aged nine and six. She was a teacher, and she'd said she wanted to go into space to humanize the technology of the space age. She was going to conduct two lessons from space. Bob Friend now reports on how Mrs. McAuliffe came to be chosen for what turned out to be such a tragic mission. From the time she was picked from 10,000 applicants, Krista McAuliffe couldn't contain her joy. I thought there was never going to be any more excitement. I mean, I could never peak any higher than I had on July 19th, and it just keeps building. Apart from the extraordinary prospect of being the first private citizen in space, what appealed to Krista most was the thought of sharing her experiences with America's schoolchildren. So I can explain to the kids <clears throat> that everything has to be held down. Scientists at NASA are fastidious with their training. Mrs. McAuliffe had to simulate the feeling of weightlessness. Oh, that's great! I love it! Another bonus, a flight in a T-38 jet. It was wonderful. He broke the sound barrier and he let me fly for a while. One of the things that I hope to bring back into the classroom is to make that connection with the students that they too are part of history, that the space program belongs to them, and to try to bring them up with the space age. The 37-year-old teacher, eventually picked from 10 finalists during a week of special tests, had planned to keep a diary of her experiences in space. When that shuttle goes, there might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be 10 souls that I'm taking with me. Her husband, a lawyer, was nervous at the prospect of his wife going into space, but shared her enthusiasm. Everybody who knows her, I think, honestly thought that, you know, there, there may have been candidates who were certainly her equal, but that there was nobody that would be superior to her. The days leading up to liftoff were marred by technical problems. Five times the launch was postponed. Then, yesterday, a screw in the shuttle's hatch became stuck. They brought in a drill, the battery failed. By the time the fault had been fixed, the winds were too strong for a launch. We are going to scrub for today and we'll be letting the crew out of the orbiter and they will go back to the crew quarters. This morning, the astronauts were given an extra hour in bed while a faulty gauge was repaired. Then, breakfast together and the ill-fated liftoff. Earlier, jubilation at Mrs. McAuliffe's school as children watched the launch. Stunned as things went horribly wrong, they filed back to their classrooms. Later tonight, Vice President George Bush is flying down to Cape Canaveral to express President Reagan's sympathy to relatives of the dead. Mr. Bush will be setting up the inquiry to find out just what went wrong. Mr. Reagan has said the shuttle program will carry on. He said we could do no more to honor these courageous people than to go ahead. And he said he does have confidence in the people who've been running the program, but he was certain there'd be no more shuttle flights until today's disaster had been fully investigated. James Wilkinson now reports on what that investigation will be looking for. The end came suddenly, unexpectedly and catastrophically. It happened so quickly, finding the trigger which set off the disaster could prove very difficult. Slow motion pictures show flames lapping up the edge of the huge external tank.